Hello, family. Welcome to your Work Auntie podcast. My name is Claudia Marie Holmes, and I am your host. I am so excited to bring you all another episode and an awesome guest. Uh, my guest today is Monica Charisse, and I'm going to let her introduce herself, but she's a phenomenal woman, so I can't wait for you all to meet her as well. All right, Monica, <laughs> tell the people about yourself. Thank you so much, Kalada. I am delighted to be here as a guest on your wonderful podcast. I am a self-discovery and intentional living coach for high achieving women over 40. I myself am a recovering perfectionist, a super success oriented high achiever who, um, found myself at a point in life where I had built a great big life that was envious from the outside looking in and decided this really can't be all there is to life. And so I took my own inner journey and am now on a path of leading other women to do the same so that they can create the life that they really dream of. That's awesome. And where are you from? Are you, uh, what, you're in the DC area, correct? I am in the D.C. area. I have been here for almost 20 years. I am a transplant. The New York in me will never, ever die. I I don't think I will ever really be able to truly claim D.C. as home, home, home. Although this is where I live. (laughs) This is where I live and I love it. Though I'm originally from upstate New York, Albany to be specific. And I went to university there. I moved to New York City afterwards, lived there for a little bit, and then came to D.C. about 20 years ago. All right. Well, I, I, I have the same experience. I've been here about 12 and a half years, and I definitely still say I'm from South Carolina. You might even catch me flipping it out there. I'm from Chicago because that's where I went to college, but I'm, I will always be from South Carolina. <laughs> I'm so. it. Got it. I definitely understand. So, um, so I my first question for you is because some people don't know what a coach is, and they think a coach is the same as a mentor, as a therapist, or you know all these different misnomers. So, yeah. what is a coach? I love that you asked this question because I do think that there is a lot of confusion in the marketplace, and although I think there are overlaps in some ways, I would say between a coach, a mentor, and maybe a consultant, I do think that the words are being used interchangeably. So what distinguishes coaching from therapy, I think the easiest way to explain it is if someone is experiencing a mental health crisis or uh, something that is prohibiting them from operating at an emotional baseline, they are having a uh, issues of depression, issues of anxiety, where they need someone to really help them to reestablish an emotional baseline in their life. That is someone, or there's, there is a significant trauma that needs to be addressed. That is for therapy. That is not something that you would want to go to a coach to address. Even matters of, um, neurodivergence if you have a situation where you require medication for um, neurodivergence that you are are dealing with that's something that if you have tried a coach and you have not been able to achieve success in terms of behavior modification you need to see a doctor that is something that you would go to a therapist or a psychiatrist for a coach is someone who is going to stand beside you and be your partner in the discovery of your own answers. So a coach, if they are purely coaching, has no agenda for the client. It is not for me to decide that I think I know best what my client should do. Even if as they are speaking to me, based on my best practices and my own experiences, I might have ideas. It's not for me to make suggestions to the client as to, you know, what what she should do. It is to ask the most powerful questions that I can guide her to the discovery of her own answers. A consultant is more of an advisory um, resource in someone's life. When you want to 
tap someone's expertise and experience and their knowledge set to actually get suggestions on what solutions might be available for the challenge that you're experiencing. That's more in the lane of consulting, which can sometimes happen in the course of a coaching session, but you would ask permission. Like, would you mind if I gave you a suggestion? But the coaching session is not for you to sit and give solutions and give advice. Coaching is not advice. It is about being asked questions and asking the in, in this, having the client discover for themselves what the answer is. A mentor, again, is somewhere in more of, it could be somewhat of both. A mentor can ask you powerful questions about what it is that you want for your future or what it is that you're reaching for and also has a wealth of experience and advice to be able to offer. And a lot of times, although some coaches are now calling themselves mentors because I think there is some static in the marketplace with respect to the word coach. So I see some coaches have changed their title to mentor. Mentors typically are not paid. They're doing it of, you know, a relationship that you have with someone at work or someone through a professional network of some kind or maybe a family friend. And they're doing this because this is something that they're providing as purely a, a service and a volunteer basis. Explaining that I, I didn't even realize that people had switched to using mentor as a, a term, but I know sometimes people, like you said, mentors don't get paid. I have mentors, peer mentors and others. I don't pay them. I just call. And usually it is more of a, like you said, a consultative conversation, like we're sh exchanging ideas. They're definitely um, not just asking me questions. So um, appreciate that. And I'm sure the listeners appreciate now the understanding and the distinctions as well. So you talked about, you know, how your own journey, how you, you know, you realized that you were at a point in life where you just felt like, is this really all that it is? Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that and how you transitioned that feeling into becoming a coach yourself? And, you know, what were the, the thoughts going through your head when you were making that transition from, I'm sure, a very lucrative career into being a coach and being your own boss? So it has been a journey. And it is still unfolding. It's still ongoing. And I will say I was raised in a very traditional family where the expectation was that you uh, would go to college. You would get a, you know, a degree, if not an advanced degree. You would get a good corporate job somewhere because even being an entrepreneur was not seen as a truly viable path in my family because of it was too um, volatile. The goal was stability and you needed to go get a good job at a good company and you needed to stay there until you retired or you needed to go get a good government job. The idea was to move toward being stable. And then as I kind of got into, you know, other circles of, you know, extended family and friends, it was about the hustle to six figures. Who can get to six figures the fastest? Because that was the next goal to shoot for. So you've got the good corporate job now. Let's go on the race to six figures. So you move up the ranks, you get to six figures. And then it's like, OK, well, what's next? We need to try to buy a home as close to 30 years old as you can. And it's about getting to the point of buying luxury cars and getting to the point of being able to travel and having all of the outward milestones of success. And so I am the good girl the, who stayed on the straight and narrow, who followed the path that my authority figures prescribed for me and did all of those things and found myself inside of a really, really expansive life and feeling very empty inside. I I was having moments of happiness that were fleeting. I did not have long-standing intrinsic joy that was just always present. And so there was a lot of 
drama that I dealt with inside of corporate environments in order to have the career that I had. A lot of microaggressions, a lot of being passed over for promotions, a lot of being overqualified and training people who were less qualified than you to take a job that ended up getting promoted. Like all of those things that ended up being soul sucking were what I was dealing with behind the scenes of this great big life. And I ended up knowing that I wanted to have some kind of business venture on the side. So about 12 years ago, I came across a business in fashion. And fashion had been one of my earliest passions. I wanted to be a model when I was young. And my mom was like, yeah, whatever. Right. We're going to go to college. <laughs> You'll get this degree. <laughs> and we're going to go into like a viable career path. So when I came across the business in fashion, it really tapped into a passion that I had allowed to die from many years ago. So I became a stylist with a designer clothing company and began to work with women on restyling them and getting their wardrobes together. And what happened is that during those conversations, we would get really, really deep into matters of life. Sometimes women would come to me after having faced a life-threatening illness and they had a new outlook on life and wanted to completely revamp their wardrobe to be more in alignment with who they felt they were after this tremendous shift in their life. Other women had gone through divorce and were rebuilding. Other women felt like they didn't know how to really express themselves through style. It was just a skill that they didn't have and they always felt strange in their clothing. They didn't like the way their bodies looked. A lot of them were dealing with you know, mild trauma from their childhood with people who said that certain colors made them look crazy. And so they would mm -hmm. even touch girls that had certain colors. So these conversations really allowed me to see that what I was doing was really pouring into these women in a way that far surpassed just styling them in terms of clothing. And then I went to my first empowerment conference for women back in 2014. And I discovered that there was this career called life coaching. I honestly had just, I guess, had my head in the sand because <laughs> I did not know that this was something that people did as a real business venture mm -hmm. that actually make a living being a coach. And it was when I discovered that this is who I am. This is what I've been meant to do my whole life. This is what I've always done with people who are friends, people that I've worked with now in this business of styling. This is just what I do. I pour into people. I want them to basically be able to see the greatness in themselves that maybe they can't see, but I can see. And I wanted it to go beyond just inspiring and motivating which is something that really unnerves me, I think, in the empowerment space, because whether sometimes it's church or whether it's empowerment conferences, motivational speakers, all of it serves a role. And I want women to not just be inspired and motivated and be hyped up emotionally after being in my presence. I want them to have actionable tools to be able to make a difference in their life, something that's going to create lasting transformation and change. So I knew that that was the path that I needed to go on. And so in tandem, I started pursuing a um, coaching certification because for me, it was important for me to, to know how to have a methodology under my belt to coach people properly before I hung my shingle. So I started doing that. And I was going through my own personal growth and development journey and really turning myself inside out and understanding who I was underneath all of the expectations that I had been living inside of my whole life. And that honestly caused me to diverge significantly from my husband at the time. And that ended up resulting in the demise of my marriage, which then was a life altering experience for me. Mm -hmm. Um, traumatic in many, many ways and a tremendous opportunity for reinvention. And so I went on that path and at the same time had gotten an opportunity to leave corporate and go out on my own as a consultant 
to do organizational development, which is still a business that I have as well. And did that for two years. And after my divorce, decided that I was going to take my life savings and go on a sabbatical for almost a year to clear my head and to completely do an emotional and life reset. And that is something that I sincerely advocate. Not that you need to be clearing out your life savings like I did. (laughs) And I wouldn't have changed it. Like if I had to do it again, I would do it. If if women in mid-career, if you've been working for somewhere in the neighborhood of like 15 to 20 years, if at all possible, whether through a family leave of absence or if you have the means to be able to support yourself by taking a break, it doesn't have to be a year, but that's something that changed my life. Being able to step away with the ability to support myself, not have the distraction and the stress of work to really get quiet and silent and understand what was really calling to me in my life to be and to do. And that was when I made the decision that I definitely needed to go down the path of really creating this business of coaching. And so I still do consulting. I did go back to another consulting job that I still, you know, I had as an independent consultant. And then I went down to halftime and then I left that uh, stable long-term contract in 2022 in order to recreate my consulting business, only working with clients that I wanted to work with, only doing work that I wanted to do and serving women through my coaching practice. So that's basically the journey that I've been on to realign my life with what I truly value and what matters most to me. And is it a hundred percent, you know, there and up and I've made some really significant strides by first leaving corporate, then leaving, working on consulting gigs that weren't really giving me joy Mm -hmm. and really filling my spirit to now, those are my standards for what it is that I will do for, you know, supporting myself in the future. I need to contribute, I need to serve. And so that's the path that I've been able to go on because of the work that I've done on myself to rediscover who I am underneath all of the expectations. Wow. You said so many great things. Um, I do want to acknowledge you for, and for those people listening, to really pay attention to leaning into your gifts because what you shared is like, this is what I do. So you recognize that being able to coach and help others is really something inside of you that you wanted to do and could give. And so people listening, because many of us are in careers where we're like, yeah, is this really it? Is this us? It's because oftentimes we didn't lean into a gift or we're following, like you said, that path that others have identified for us you know you get the career you get the six figures you get the designer car for us single women we get a dog (laughs) we name and dress it real cute you know we're going on the international trips for the gram and so oftentimes we're left with a lot of you know unhappiness and sometimes even not even authentic relationships because we're not living and what really makes us happy and sometimes we're also masking like we're unhappy we might even be depressed and we're just like oh it's all good um so really want to acknowledge you for taking that leap and so for those listening i'm sure when you went on these journeys there were people in your life who were like oh girl you're crazy what's wrong with you i would never how would you, how did you, and how do you recommend people wanting to take those leaps of faith? How do they deal with the naysayers and the negative people in their life that don't see their vision? Absolutely. And it will happen. And I think it's important to, on the one hand, prepare yourself for the journey of growth, which is sometimes very lonely. I was actually just in a conversation with a group of people last night and some of the women were talking about that, how some they had a life altering event that put them on a journey of self-discovery and lost people in their lives. Others knew that this is the thing that was meant for them to do, to go on a path of self-discovery and they were resisting it or afraid of doing it for fear of losing people in their lives. And so it can be a lonely journey 
I have had shifts in relationships in my own life where things that I was into for a good portion of my life, things that I would be happy to kiki on the phone about and, you know, go down the rabbit hole about, I just, I don't have an interest in those things anymore. And so it has created a shift in the relationship. And what's important to do, and I'm so thankful that I've been able to find this in my life, is you then find other people. You find other people who are also in a seeking space, who are also on a journey of discovery, who are into the conversations that you want to have so that you don't feel isolated and you don't feel by yourself. So now I have lots of different pockets of, of friends and acquaintances in my life and I didn't have to cut off anybody. I have people, you know, from my life as it was and I love them and they are still great and wonderful relationships. There are some of those um, friends who have started their own discovery journey, their own personal discovery journey. So now, like, whereas maybe a couple of years ago, we didn't really know exactly what to really talk about for a substantive conversation. Now they can relate. So sometimes people will kind of catch up. And then yeah. I also have different communities and friends that I've made in these other communities of heart-centered entrepreneurs, people who are all about expanding conscious awareness on the planet, all about, you know, um, being like spiritual based entrepreneurs who are, are really out to make a difference. And I can have those kinds of conversations about personal development and discovery with them. So it's important to create community. Community is always available. We have to be willing to create it. Yes, create it and get out of our comfort zone. I think one of the things you said, I think about an episode I did a few months ago where we talked about finding your circle of people and not, you know, just sitting, being isolated and being afraid, like going out because you people aren't just going to come to you sitting at home in the house and maybe <laughs> on social media, but you really have to make a, a real intentional effort to find the people that are on the journey you're on because oftentimes the people who you've had with you all along like you said, they may be on a different path now. And it's yeah. not that you don't, can't have them in your life. It's just not the same. And so you I, may have to find, but I sometimes see people who will stay stuck in a place because they don't know what to do and they don't want to lose those relationships because they don't want to start over or make new friends or have to trust other people. And so it's really important to, you know, find people that really can benefit like it's a mutual relationship so it's not just taking from them but so you can support and really protect each other I think that's so important I hear from some women that it's either they have the perspective of no new friends like I don't need I don't need no new friends like I'm too old to be making new friends or just not even knowing how because when you think about some of the relationships that we've had for a significant portion of life either they've developed from childhood or they may have developed from some common experience that we shared like college or you know graduate school or something like that or a job that we may have had for some period of time so when you think about well how do you really if it's not because it came up in that environment like right. how do you how do you even begin to connect with somebody to even be friends and even if you meet somebody out and about somewhere or somewhere um like how do you be how do you become friends with somebody in in your 40s so that's actually something i've been considering is having either like an interactive class or some kind of experience on how to make friends because I think that that is a skill I think that, people need it yeah. <laughs> I, just, 
and there's so much trauma like you know people living in their past it's like well I don't need friends because this happened to me my, my last friend did this my last friend did that and so instead of giving other people opportunities they built this wall up around them yeah. and relationships are so critical especially when you're going through things and then also like they are you should learn from them so things that don't go the way you want it yes learn from them but don't treat the entire world as though they are whatever that situation was that didn't work out for you but I often hear that too especially on social media it's a lot of I don't need and I got okay <laughs> like you know, you know we need people. A place of pain it's coming from a place of pain when not wanting to be hurt it's like mm-hmm. you know a guard dog like protecting their their emotions yeah and then you end up being even more isolated and no one yeah. to help you you can't deal with or want to work through emotions or just have fun like sometimes mm-hmm. you just want people so you can get outside and go be in the you know be in the air and breathe yeah. with just and just a good time but you need people to be able to do that so I appreciate yeah. your perspectives on that I was going to also acknowledge the conversation about microaggressions I know right now with us you know, the hybrid workforce and they want everybody to go back to the office. That that is one area where black people, especially black women, a lot of us don't want to go back to the office because of the microaggressions. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're at home on Zoom, you don't have to deal with the random person coming into your office every day and be like, well, what new hairdo do you have now? And (laughs) and so, you know, all the little things that people think are funny or cute and we're like, yeah, I'm exhausted. I'm tired of talking Mm -hmm. to you about black hair and why my hair sticks up sometimes and why it's down or you know are you making comments about how articulate I am still not recognized in 2023 at the time or 24 like we shouldn't be talking about or being surprised by black people or black women being articulate um so yeah I think that's something that a lot of us are dealing with and it's you know and recently I'm sure you saw the story of the lady who unfortunately um ended her life because she was being harassed Mm -hmm. um and so really want to encourage people who are listening if you are experiencing things like that please find a way out talk to people in your circle who can help you and give you advice go to leadership but don't stay in situations like that but before the holidays i did a lot around stuff that people like friendship and resilience but one of the things i talked about is that jobs are not for enduring enduring Mm -hmm. is for athletes (laughs) <laughs> like they need to have endurance but when you're at work and you're enduring and you're suffering that's not the place you should be so you have to assess why you're in that space and if it's something you can address address it but if it's something that you can't change easily don't leave yourself in environments that are harmful so I just wanted to say that because I've seen that story floating around and I you know feel so bad for the woman that experienced this but also all the people that lost are experiencing the loss of her because yeah. you know she was able to deal with this situation um and no one around her protected her um for the, the people who should so definitely you know i appreciate you bringing that up and want people listening to know like that's not normal you shouldn't have to stay in environments like that and you know report it do what you need to do mm-hmm. you br- but and you bring up a good question around inviting the assessment of well why what why would you stay in the environment and sometimes people will say well i need the money i need this Mm -hmm. job i have to pay for such and such and i think that we've in our society become so used to people suffering it's like it just it's just like a normal thing for people to suffer on the job it's a normal thing for people to to not like it or to feel miserable on sunday night going you know thinking about going to work or living the whole week for the weekend and you're not even present to how quickly your life is just whizzing by because you are surviving your life mm-hmm. you're not really enjoying your life you're enjoying the weekends but you're not enjoying your life So that's something that I really had to ask myself during the quiet moments when I was reflecting on disliking the experience that I had and asking myself, what am I really doing this for? And why is that important? And I know that as a consultant, Kalata, you know the five whys. Like you got to get down to the bottom. Like you keep asking, okay, well, why is that important? Well, because of this. Okay, well, why is that important? And all the way down to the source. And a lot of times we think that it's it's security. Mm-hmm. 
yeah. I need stability, I need security. Not recognizing or keeping top of mind that when you're working for a corporation, any day they can decide, hey, we've got to make <laughs> right. we've got to make budget cuts or we're just going mm-hmm. in a new strategic direction or we're moving this unit overseas or anything could happen Mm -hmm. and your job could just be gone and yet we cling for dear life to these positions as if there are no other alternatives and that there's there's no nothing else that we can do other than to completely survive and we've become I think in a way used to being mistreated which is very unfortunate it's like it's just par for the course you read every Mm -hmm. article it's just what people are dealing with and so I'm just dealing with what everybody else is dealing with. Yeah, but that doesn't make it right. Exactly. It doesn't make it right. And I think that's the thing our generation appreciates about a Gen Z is because they're like, we don't care. We're not we're not dealing with that. Right. Like, uh, like so maybe when they start having kids and stuff, they'll be like, oh, like maybe, you know, because that's when people start making the reasons and excuses. But right now, and I think millennials definitely set that path or that tone to say, this isn't right. I'm not going to be mm-hmm. mistreated. I work hard. Mm-hmm. I bring value to the organization. So the same way you pay me, I also give you back in resources and talent oh, yeah. and I'm helping your organization make money. So don't act like this is a charity like I'm not here and you're paying me and I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs I'm coming in here every day creating results for you and you know when I was in private sector creating profit for you so Uh this is a mutual relationship so I need you to treat me well and I'll treat you well Um, and also you know like you said being loyal to these companies it's like any day now they can decide for whatever reason are someone above them or or sometimes they just get shut down right so don't put all your eggs into a basket that you can't carry <laughs> it's like right. it's like someone or somebody else's basket and you got all your eggs over there and your whole um, life is dependent on that so yeah people definitely there's like you said get down to that really why are you staying and the security and is that security really worth your mental well-being and wellness and you know there's people that don't go to the doctors they don't even take care of themselves because they are so pressured and caught up in these jobs and is your health worse that you know yeah. so it's like really considering the why so yeah I think that's good and hopefully today in a conversation um, on my team mentioned that like yeah you know I'm over 40 and I'm trying to figure it out I don't know what my next role is and so you know and I said oh I'm talking to someone later today that coaches um, but I, I was telling them I said you have to be open to opportunities um, because they you know they wanted to stay at the organization we were, we were in and I said you know I get it, but I also want you to be open to opportunity. So I still want you to update your resume. I yeah. still want you to apply. I still want you to like, this is not it. Like, while I get that you like it, this is not it. So I want to make sure that, you know, you are setting yourself up. If you want to retire early, I was like, uh, this is not it. <laughs> That's like, yeah. for your, some of your goals, this may not be it. So I think people just realizing, and 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 I and it's be it's okay to be afraid. When I first mm-hmm. left my first position after... I was there eight and a half years. I was the whole time I was like freaking out. Like I'm leaving. This is, I'm going to have to meet new people. I don't know. And, and what if this doesn't work out? What if they, what if they don't think I do a good job? So the having the fear is normal, but you have to do, you have to do it best for you. And I'm so glad I left. And honestly, once I left my first role, I left the next one after two years. (laughs) The next one. So it like gives you that freedom to like hop around and see what works for you. And there were some roles where they asked me back. So I went back and said, hey, okay, I can do another year or two, but really life is too short to not take risk people. Like I know there's that security in place, but if you need some security, make a plan. How much money do you need to set aside? How can you create some savings? What are some puzzles? What can you do so that you can feel comfortable? Um, Because I know a lot of us millennials don't have savings because we don't, (laughs) <laughs> you know, the YOLO mentality living on the edge living on the edge <laughs> exactly we're like oh we can make it back we can't retire anyway we might as well just right. say it but you know make a plan make a strategy if you don't have it so that you can do that but yeah don't don't just stay because you got bills to pay we all have bills to pay yep. and they'll, they'll get paid as long as you have a plan now don't uh-huh. just walk in tomorrow and quit and say I hate this and burn all the bridges if you don't have a plan I mean I wouldn't recommend that but do you right. <laughs> so, yeah so I have a um one question I do have um, mm-hmm. back to your client base right so what is a common experience you're seeing among women over 40 that are high performing um you know what is really 
the thing in the workplace or in their personal lives that has been one of the hardest things for them to navigate? Like, is there a common thread that you see among your clients? Yes. And I think that it's the summation of how I described my own journey. I am a really big fan of Joseph Campbell, who is an artist. He's not an artist. He's an author and a philosopher, an American philosopher. And he did a lot of work on this concept called the hero's journey. And I'm actually a fan of the heroine's journey, which is slightly different. It's okay. less about going out to like slay a dragon externally and coming back home. It's more about discovering who you are. That's the heroine's journey. But anyway, he did a lot of work on like the power of myth and mythology and how there's like this story of human development or like the life cycle of a human being that is captured a lot of times in adventure stories, whether they're in fairy tales or adventure movies and things like that. And he has this really powerful quote that says that there's nothing worse than climbing a ladder, like climbing a ladder in life and discovering that it was against the wrong wall. Mm -hmm. And that basically, I think, in a nutshell, is the quintessential way to sum up the experience of the women that I work with. It's the path. There's there's mm -hmm. this sociocultural expectation that you are going to create a certain kind of life that yields being a productive citizen, being a successful person in society. And the good girl type A perfectionist women, they followed the path. They did what they were told. They, they you know, made decisions to avoid the pitfalls that they saw other women and peers in their life kind of fall to and they made it they made it and they created everything that they were told would be the um, components of a successful life and they have it but there's that there's something that is missing and they, some of them have not been able to figure out, like they've got this nagging feeling that something is off. They've got the feeling that there there has to be more than this, but what's next? I, I've done all the things. Like I have the career now, like I've, I've got the, the relationship, I've got like everything or whatever, or, or they didn't do it. Or, you know, there's the formula and there's some part of it that's missing. Maybe they're not married. Maybe they don't have children. Maybe they don't have the house yet, but there's a formula that is kind of unspoken that this is a formula that you're supposed to follow. And you've got a story around either having completed all the, you've checked the boxes, but okay, like what's supposed to happen at this point? Right. <laughs> you were supposed to do, you should have done it and you didn't do it. And now you've got a story about that. and. Both paths lead to disenchantment. In some cases, lead to depression. They lead to this this sense of dissatisfaction that some women are able to put their finger on, but some women are just not. And there's a lot of shame around it. And they don't have anyone to talk to because many of them, looking from the outside in, you would be like, girl, what you complaining about? You got this, you got that, you got this job, you're driving this car, you got this house, you have, you know, this amazing husband, you have these kids, or you have, like, you travel all the time, girl, like, you have these clothes, you got bags, you have shoes, all of these things, but inside, she's feeling empty because this stuff doesn't really represent who she really is. And they realize that there's some dissonance between the them that they feel themselves to be and this character that they've created that is mm -hmm. now living this life many times inside of a gilded cage that she's built for herself and she's trapped inside of a life that really doesn't mean anything to like her sole purpose 
Like it's all the things that her parents and authority figures and her bosses encouraged her. It's all the things that everybody else told her that she should do and who she should be. And it had little, if anything, to do with who she really is and what she really wanted to do. And so when you've gotten to the point where you've lived half your life, Mm -hmm. that can be very um, disruptive to really sit and think about because you don't know well, where do you go from here what what do you do now at this point do I start over do I take the risk because um, I always tell people and, and why I also really encourage my younger employees and mentors while you're not at that point where you've reached that level where it's like I make too much I'm at this level I have this title explore Mm -hmm. You know, try different things, go do different jobs. You know, even, you know, when you work for the government, a lot of people are like, oh, I would never leave my good government job. You have tenure. You can come back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Go out and explore. And because you don't want to be 40 or 50 years old looking back saying, I really wish I had done something differently with my life or I didn't expect to be there. You know, especially if you're you don't want to be an executive or a CEO or whatever else, go explore. Make sure you've tried the different paths and, you know, so you don't have to start over. Um, Because I think the scary thing, like when you've reached that six figure mark and and even like I have friends who have like double like like half a million dollar jobs. It's like I can't start over now. Like I can't, you know, I can't go for my five hundred thousand dollar or three hundred thousand dollar a year job to do this thing I actually want to do. And so, you know, it's like, well, try it when you're early, younger, so you can like get that off your mind of like, oh, I wanted to do this. And now that I'm reminiscing and thinking about what it would be like, oh, this dream I had. Um, so really encouraging people to try things and then take the risk and then don't be afraid to start over. I mean, if yeah. you have a skill, you can always go back. If you are a well-known doctor, you can always go back to be a doctor. And you are a well-known <laughs> lawyer. Um, when I left the government the first time, you know, a lot of people were like, oh my God, you are you left your good government job and benefits. I'm like, I can come back, y'all. It's, uh-huh. it's I, I didn't give up the skill. I didn't forget how to be right. a government employee. I, yeah. I didn't forget how to do, you know, the work that I've done. So I think people just have to realize that you can always go back. You don't lose the skill, right? You don't lose the experience, and so it's like take that time so you're not living with regret. And and I think that's what a lot of people probably are living. They're like, well, I wish I would have done, or not even thinking about other things because, like you said, we stayed on the path. Someone was like, right. you should be a lawyer, you should be a doctor, you should be, mm-hmm. you know. And when we were growing up, that was the only three successful only things you could be. Oh, a good while now. Exactly. And so it's like when you even went into other paths, it's like, what is a consultant? Or excuse me? (laughs) So you're not a doctor, lawyer, but it's like there's more out there and you can feel successful at any salary. You can feel successful in any job. But I think, like you said, society, we have these stories that you're only successful. You can only be respected. You can only do stuff, which is why I also love the shakeup of the current generation and all these like their self-made wealthy (laughs) people like starting on Twitch and Twitter (laughs) and Instagram and YouTube. And these people are out here driving Porsches and they Mm -hmm. have mansions and houses because they bet on themselves. And mm-hmm. even when they only had five followers, they kept going. And when they had a thousand followers, they kept going. And so people were always like, that's not a real job. But well, real, it, it pays real job money. We have to read the farmer. <laughs> yeah, we have to sure. read the farm Because again, all of that is a story. Like mm-hmm. who said that it wasn't real? We I mean, that's the, the fundamental thing that I would recommend for anyone who is experiencing some sense of dissatisfaction in their life is to press pause. To press pause everywhere that you can. Like even if, you know, I recommended before taking a sabbatical or taking a leave of some sort to really situate yourself and to really understand what your life is calling for you to do and who your life is calling for you to be outside of the distraction and the noise of things that you feel you have to do because you're committed to them or when you're caught up in a routine and you're distracted and you're not even thinking about this stuff life is just passing you by and you're not giving conscious thought to whether this is the thing that you really want to do are you really happy what is a plan if any that you want to take in order to put yourself on a different path if this is not the one that you really want to be on 
but it's you know basically to to inquire of yourself in order for you to know what's going to satisfy your soul you have to understand who you are like that's really the step one and I like anything that you are able to do to facilitate that discovery whether it is the trying of new things whether it is to just stop and spend time with yourself spend time in silence you know as as much as you can during the course of the day that's why people you know meditate but it's not necessarily about meditation and trying to not think it's about giving your brain a rest from the distraction so that you can actually be able to hear what is within you because we all have our own answers like mm-hmm. we are all our own geniuses but the answers are inside and we have to be willing to put ourselves in a space and position to be able to hear what our life is calling for us to do like what is that innermost guidance calling for us to do and to be yeah I appreciate the idea of a break one of the things I didn't do enough is at some point I wasn't taking any time off like I was working just back to back to back to back to back to back to back and even though I was still in the uh, you know the, the current occupation it was those breaks that really helped me figure out like what wasn't working and mm-hmm. what I could do differently for me but like you said if you're just working and you're coming in every day and you don't take give yourself time so even if it's a short break give yourself time and if you don't you don't feel comfortable or your company for some reason doesn't allow you to do a sabbatical or like Monica said you just can't still take some time have a week where you're on a staycation you don't necessarily have to go anywhere just uh-huh. take the time off and that's something I started doing there's several I used to only take leave if I had some place to go but one of the things I have learned to appreciate is just taking a week off sitting in the house in my pajamas with my dog yeah. <laughs> reading books watching tv uh working journaling reflecting whatever it is but yeah that time really has mattered so I want to encourage those of you if you were like me and you only take leave if you have someplace to go stop it mm-hmm. take a vacation if you just want a vacation a vacation doesn't mean like traveling for vacation honestly is a new thing because we have a little more money mm-hmm. as millennials but our parents didn't travel when they <laughs> It's right. off a lot of us. They took right. that week off and we went right. to church. <laughs> right, right. We went to grandma's house. Like, oh, you know? with the revival. <laughs> exactly. Like we we didn't just, you know, go to Florida or go to whatever. Like I didn't come from a family where we could do that. So my right. mom had vacation and we were still at home. We went to the yeah. beach or whatever else. But uh-huh. you know, don't always think you need to go somewhere or you have to be in Waikiki. You can, mm-hmm. you know, you can drive down to or drive up to Eastern Shore if you're in D.C. or if you're near any sort of coast or water or any place. Just go take a break. Um, You know, an extended break is better. Um, Sabbatical. I've always wanted to do a sabbatical and have not. Um, But I'm thinking maybe either in the next year or two, I was like, that might be something where I'm like, hey, I'm just going to take a couple months off and I'll be back. Um, You know, just to like spend time really thinking about the next phase of you know my life and where everything is going so I hope others listening will be inspired you know to take that break to really think about what they what they want to do so one Mm -hmm. question I do have for you is for other people who are interested in coaching what would you share as what they would consider or what you would recommend they think about before they go into coaching okay I firmly believe that coaching is a being versus a doing. I have seen in recent years many people jumping on the coach bandwagon as an opportunity to have a money that makes biz- that you know a business that makes money. We are experiencing. I mean, we still haven't even gotten to the place where I think the the tide of mental health challenges, particularly coming out of the COVID era, have even surfaced yet. So there is a lot of opportunity in the mental health space and not everyone requires the services of a therapist. And there are some people and I'm I'm a huge advocate of of therapy and there are clients that I've worked with that have had both a therapist and a coach because they serve different functions Um, and you have to really have a heart for 
people and a heart for service and be able to truly listen to people and not just be quiet while somebody is talking but to be able to truly hear what they're saying and both what they are expressing verbally and in what they're not saying and to have the capacity to hold space for someone meaning allow them to be with their own emotions and resist the urge to step in and interrupt when someone is experiencing a difficult emotion. So many of us we want to help. I think the natural human tendency is to want to step in and to want to help, to want to soothe, to want to uh to calm. And I think a really great coach is someone who is able to witness someone in the totality of their experience and to literally just be with them and their emotions and help them to recognize that their emotions are okay that them having a a, a so-called negative emotion like i honestly believe that all emotions are useful i hesitate to even say that there are positive and negative emotions we just have emotions that's who we are as humans we are built to experience emotions and it's about recognizing what they are and whether they are helpful and serve whatever we're up to at any given time because sometimes anger can serve a very very good purpose sometimes mm-hmm. frustration can be a catalyst so it's not so much that they are in and of themselves bad or negative and we have to be able to allow them i think there's a lot of suppression that goes on and there's a lot of people who are not even able to feel their feelings or they have access mm-hmm. to just a very few of them because they were socialized and came up in environments where it wasn't acceptable to have certain emotions so now they're not even sure of how to express them so that's what it is it's it's a beingness that you exhibit inside of a coaching session to be able to allow someone to express to be with their emotions and to then guide them on a journey of exploring themselves such that they're able to find their own answers. No, that's very helpful. And I think, like you said, a lot of people do go into coaching for the money and also, uh, you know, not al- not always the reasons where it's like, I want to really be there for or with people. It's something to do. But one thing I know when people go into professions like therapists, coaches, mentors, whatever, people who want to go into those often are are prevented or blocked by a story they made up is that you need to be perfect. You need Mm -hmm. to have everything in your life together to guide others. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that idea. (laughs) So I also, I just created a post online about this yesterday. Uh, I still battle with perfectionism and I still myself have to be coached by my coaches that I don't have to have it all together. A great coach for someone is a person who is only a few steps ahead. They are close enough that they still have very tangible and palpable memories and understanding of what it's like to be in their client's shoes. And they're not so far ahead that the client views them and where they are as unattainable. Mm-hmm. So it's, I mean, it's impossible to have everything figured out. And I think that showing people who are following us, showing our clients that we are still human and that the only difference is that we have tools to be able to work through some of these challenges in a way that maybe they don't because they don't have the tools. And that's the point of you know, going going into a coaching engagement is that you're able to share the tools with someone. It's also much easier in life generally, I think as a human tendency, to be able to observe, reflect, and provide um, space to help someone discover the challenges in their life 
than it is to apply the work on ourselves. That's why okay. all great coaches have coaches. Okay. Because one of my coaches uh, characterize it this way is that when you're the pickle inside the jar, you can't read the label. <laughs> so you can't necessarily like you can see a very similar challenge like you and, and a client can be having a very similar challenge in life. You will be able to see and like dial in on that client's challenge so much more quickly and effectively than you being able to see it in in yourself. So you're human. It's not necessary to have all the answers, particularly as a coach. It's not about having the answers. It's about having the right questions to ask that's going to help them elicit their own answers. And it's always possible as a coach to have a coach, to have your own uh, compassionate witness of your experience so that you can have the courage and confidence to be able to go out and coach others powerfully. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. And I'm one thing I try to do a lot too, also on the podcast, like you said, it's important to let people know we're human. When I'm talking about things, sometimes I'm like, this is a good, good advice. It doesn't mean I'm not struggling. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the same thing, you know, because, yeah. you know, I will talk about it. Um, I have an episode, some people I'm bringing on soon to talk about their journey with getting through their weight loss challenges and so that's been a journey i've been on most of my life like up and down up and down and so i'm going to hear from them and i'm going to share advice and they can share it but i am not someone who is not in the struggle like i know how to lose weight but it's like the keeping it off has been the challenge for me so it's like it's always good to let people know like i'm not perfect one thing i've also learned to do as I, especially at work and with people who are younger than me or even just subordinates, I've always been very honest about what I don't know as well. Because sometimes mm-hmm. people start to believe that because you're in certain positions or certain titles, yeah. oh, you must know everything. And I'm like, no, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't no. know. And also letting people know what I've really been messaging a lot lately too is asking others for help. So how you have a coach, I have other peer mentors and colleagues. When I don't know something, I immediately pick up the phone. I don't mm-hmm. sit here and struggle. <laughs> Like, like right. why would I do that when I have people around me that I can reach out to and say, hey, I'm facing this challenge. Have you faced this? How would you deal with it? And so it's the same message. I think you all could take this, even if you're not planning to be a coach in your life, find people that you can go to to help you see the label. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are the pickle in the jar. <laughs> so, I love it. that analogy. Yes. And someone, I think it's important for particularly women to have people in their life who will not commiserate. So right, it's one yeah. thing to have like your good girlfriend who you're going to be able to call up and complain and she's just going to jump right there in there, you know, jump right in there with okay. you. And before you know it, it's like a whole complaint fest. There's times where you're going to need to vent your frustration and to have that friend who's going to basically, yeah, girl, I understand. Like me too, girl. And no, they shouldn't have done that. And blah, and blah, they blah. And they stupid. And that dumb blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> And when it's time for you to actually want to, you know, figure out a solution or a path forward for a situation that you're dealing with, it's important to also have people in your life who are going to be able to really just hold that space for you and to not indulge your complaint and to not go down that spiral with you. And when it's your own self that's put yourself in a predicament or a situation who is going to lovingly call you out and be like, okay, girl. So like what I'm really hearing you say is like, I think there's some things for you to possibly get together or, you know, what, what is the role that you see that you played in the situation? Like what, what can you take responsibility for? And it's not about, you know, you blaming yourself, but it's like, okay, what part of this can you own? for yourself mm-hmm. or well, okay so what is it that you actually want rather than let's con- you know continuing to go around the you know the the circle here as far as all the things that have gone wrong and all the issues okay well what is it that you would like to see what is it right. what is the outcome that you actually do want and calling you forth to your best self like I see better for you I see better in you 
And, you know, I want you to see what I see, someone who's going to, to really help to elevate and to really push you to your best self. Definitely someone to hold you accountable. Um, mm-hmm. I've talked about that a lot too. Like you need an accountable, somebody in your life that holds you accountable. Cause all of us, like you said, have that girlfriend that's like, you can call them and say anything. And they'll be like, yeah, girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you, you know, right off mm-hmm. and, and, yeah. and whatever it is, but keep her around. Cause you still need yes. that friend occasionally, but you still need that friend that you're going to call. And they're going to go, what? Hey, let's, right. let's back up. <laughs> let's yeah. talk about that. And some people see that as not being a good friend, but your good friends want what's best for you. And by mm-hmm. wanting what's best for you, it means they're going to challenge you and they're going to yeah. ask you hard questions. Um, mm-hmm. So that's what you definitely want. So definitely appreciate that's something I've been trying to say, like find people who can hold you accountable. And that also means probably expanding your circle. So back to the one of the original points find more friends get out there and meet people and there's ways to do it like you said if you're not in school is there's conferences if you like if you're if you're into comic con if you're into architecture if you're into business if you're into engineering there are conferences there's events there's meetup groups so you don't even really have to like just go to bars and and figure it out and go to events that are cultivated for you to meet people right it's, it it's, so much more easy. it's so much more easy than I think most people think that it is. And I do think yeah. that we hit on something before that a lot of it is, is it's like sister wounds. Mm-hmm. There, I'm hurt there in a relationship and that has not been resolved or it's not resolved within the person. And so rather than resolving it, it's holding on to it and preventing what could be inside of another relationship that could be the very best thing ever and i think a lot of times while we are living we don't recognize how young we are and how god willing we have a lot of time left like even if you're in your 40s and you meet someone new and you hit it off you could potentially be friends for another 40 50 years Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's not too late like the only friends that like it's not in absolute that the only people that you can have as close long-term friends are friends that you met earlier in your life. Mm-hmm. It's totally possible to meet people later in life and have those be substantial long-term relationships. Mm-hmm. So I think people who don't open themselves up to that really do sell themselves short. Yeah. It does. And as we're sharing, it can also impact your, you know, your feelings of success and your feelings of self-worth of worth. Cause I, cause a lot of with self-worth comes from others, right? It's not just you thinking I'm amazing, but also having people around you to big you up when you don't, you feel like you're not being your best self. Like that's also what's good to have friends around you that are good. And we talked about that. in I think episode now that I'm forgetting, I'm like, like I've done so many episode <laughs> five. We talked about that as well. Like have friends around that are going to help you get through it. And then if they're not good friends, being okay with also letting them go. Just like if work isn't serving you, as we're talking about here, sometimes relationships don't serve us. Right. So whether that's a platonic relationship or a romantic relationship, also ask yourself, why are you in it? Uh If it's not serving you, if the person doesn't make you feel good about yourself, um, you know, your visions don't align. Why are you in it? Is it because you've known them so long? Is it because you think they don't have other friends? What are if whatever your reasons are, if it's not because you you and this person have a genuine connection and have a supportive relationship of each other? Uh Why? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and then the hurt, I will say, if you are in that, you know, some of many of us listening and many of us have had experiences, get, talk to somebody about it so that you can get yourself to a place where you can be more open again. Cause as Monica said, we have so much more time left on this earth and you want people to spend that time with, you know, it's, you know, it for whatever, whatever that is, you know, whether it's a phone call, whether it's actually being physically present, like you want to spend time with people. Um, so a couple of questions before we wrap up. Um, what book has changed your life the most? It is really difficult to put my hands on one particular book. Um, one book that I will say made a real difference for me, and people might think it's a little crazy. It's actually a fiction book. 
It's called Life of Pi by oh, Yann okay. Martell. So they did make a movie out of it. Mm-hmm. I do think that the book was better. I am <laughs> it normally is. Yeah, I definitely I'm one of those like I like to read books that make me think a lot. Uh like very cerebral books. And there's a lot of metaphor and almost like parable esque writing inside of that book that ultimately has you to really question what is belief and the power of of belief and how it's possible to really believe whatever it is that is true for you and how that choice that you're making and what to believe permeates your entire perspective of of life and what's real and what's not. Ooh, that's good. I haven't gotten around. I think I have Life of Pi, but I think it's one of the books I haven't read. I'm a book hoarder. <laughs> so I, I'm I buy hardback books. I um I keep them on my shelves. I have some in my storage wow. unit. I wow. just keep buying, and then sometimes I get to them, and then a new book will come out, and I yeah. forget to go to. Um, and I have had a book club, which helped me keep up, mm-hmm. but I also have paused my book club um, because I was doing most of the work. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so I restarted. It will be a new structure of multiple people putting in hands, but yeah, I also am a big fiction reader. And some, and you can find a message. I always say to people, you can find messages in anything if you're open to it. Um, mm-hmm. I remember before, like, I wasn't necessarily depressed, but I was struggling. And I remember watching an episode of Criminal Minds and it randomly one of the guys, I forgot his name down, he was talking about how he could tell this person was depressed because of what their home looked like. And then I'm sitting in my apartment going, <laughs> I need to make some <laughs> Exactly, because I'm like, I need to make some adjustments. And then it, it also talks about how if you keep your home in the way that it was, it actually enhance, like makes you stay depressed longer because you're seeing this chaos and so you can't move past it. So it, I was like, okay, I got to clean up. Like I got to get out of whatever funk I was. Mm-hmm. And that was a fictional show. And I didn't go Google to see if what he said was actually true. But when I was looking around, I was like, what he's saying, I, it resonates and I need to take an action. Right. So, you know, so I'm a true believer of any any media, yeah. and whether fiction or nonfiction, you can find messages that can be life changing or at least give you momentum in the moment, uh, which is also why I check my backseat for dangerous people before I get in. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so And what's interesting is that, like, I actually don't. I hardly read fiction anymore. Like I mm-hmm. hardly read fiction anymore. However, there are so many books out there that have messages. I mean, I it's almost like I I flipped at some point. I don't know what it was because I never used to read nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Like I used to only be a fiction reader, and you know the whole genre of personal development and self help. I can remember being in college and completely poo pooing. The, the whole thing I didn't understand why people read those kind of books like what were they really going to help you with anyway what are you reading that for girl I mean I, all the time and now I can't really get enough of nonfiction books and there are so many books in fiction that what I love about them is they can be just as impactful mm-hmm. as like reading the information straight up sometimes reading it in metaphor reading it through symbols having access to it through an indirect means can have an even deeper impact than reading about the concepts in a nonfiction book and that's one of the reasons why I really like um, Life of Pi there's another book that is a fiction book but it's about life And it's Life's Golden Ticket by Brendan Burchard. So Brendan Burchard is a high performance coach. And he's got a couple of, he's got books that are nonfiction. And he's got books that are fiction. And I think that Life's Golden Ticket is another kind of like parable about like the life and the meaning of life and what's really most important and things like that. 
Um, I also love that fiction promotes imagination. And I think that that's one of the things that diminishes over time and age because we are stuffed further and further into boxes in conformity the older that we get. And so being able to have access points back into curiosity and fascination and wonder and awe, which I think is what sometimes escaping into a story that is fictional can do is really important. So I think it's it's healthy to have like a balance, particularly for people like me who are like nonfiction junkies to go back into books that help to evoke that that um that skill really of imagination and cultivating awe and wonder in your life no i have to really get into i don't have to but i would like to get into more reading more of the non-fiction books like you said i'm very much a fiction person and i'm like you i was forced to read a lot of books when i because i was working on a doctorate at one program and it was in, at one point it was in psychology Mm-hmm. So they made you read all these kind of books, like books yeah. I wanted to read. And I was like, oh, my yeah. God, you know, like, my it's like what you needed to read. And, you know, we talk about them and the concepts. And that's actually something I'm considering is going back to finish my program. But really like, OK, being in the mindset of reading these kind of books again and reading the nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Like you said, it's like I love the imagination and and seeing the characters and imagining mm-hmm. what's happening. Um, so often when people ask you ask me, like, what are my favorite books? I usually fix, you know, like not <laughs> like fiction books. And mm-hmm. people are often surprised because they expect me to say something like, oh, good to great or are <laughs> you know are LinkedIn by Sheryl Sandberg and no I'm talking about Jack Reacher books um, right, right. so so that's you know the thing like you know I get into and so what is one message if you can leave people listening today if they skip to the end <laughs> what is what is your end of book last page of the book what is that message you want to share with my listeners the most important journey that you can ever take is the one to discover yourself. Um, so, Miss uh, Monica Sharice, where can people find you if they have questions, want to work with you? You know, how can they reach you? Absolutely. I can be found on Facebook. You can send me a friend request at Monica Sharice. I also have a Facebook community called Haven a self-discovery salon for enterprising women over 40. It's a private group, but it is searchable on Facebook. So you can certainly um, submit a request to join that group. I'm on IG at Monica Sharice and you can find me there. (laughs) <laughs> and you're also on LinkedIn, right? If you want to find me there as well. Yes. I'm yes. Monica Sharik Brewster on LinkedIn. You can also yes. find me on LinkedIn. Yes, for sure. And for those of you who are listening or watching on YouTube, I will also have the contact information for Monica Sharik in the description box below. So make sure you check that out. Make sure you reach out. Monica, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, when I heard about the work that you did, I was so excited and knew that there were listeners that would benefit from hearing what you, you know, you've experienced, what you offer and just general, this the life advice. And also I'm inspired by your journey and the fact that you got off the good girl path <laughs> and created your own journey and took risk. And hopefully other listeners are also inspired. So again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And for my listeners, thank you for listening um like follow subscribe share do all those things uh you're much appreciated and remember we're all in this together so have a great one thank you